panel discussion on competition, economics, growth, and innovation. For this, what I'd like request is I'll invite each of the panelists to come and take their seat on, on the dais. And then I'll invite the panel moderator to help with the panel uh, discussion. So um, the, uh, the first person I'd like to invite is Professor Rishikesh Krishnan. He's currently the director of Indian Institute of Management in Dor. He has recently published Eight Steps to Innovation, which won the Best Book Award for 2013-14 from the Indian Society for Training and Development. He's listed in the Thinkers 50 India list of most influential management thinkers from India. Welcome, Professor. His talk will focus on innovation in and from India, the who, where, what, and when. Next, I'd like to invite Dr. Girish Sahani. He's Director General Council of Scientific and Industrial Research. His contributions are in the area of protein cardiovascular drugs, especially clot busters and their mode of action in the human body. His team was responsible for India's first indigenous clot buster drug. He's a fellow at Indian National Science Academy and at Indian Academy of Science in Bangalore. He's also the recipient of many awards and rec was recognized for his work by Vigyan Ratan Award in 2014. Welcome, Dr. Sagirish Sani. <laughs> Next, I'd like to invite Sri Anil Gupta, founder Honeybee Networks and executive vice chair, National Innovation Foundation. Anil is globally renowned scholar in the area of grassroots innovation. He has been a professor at the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. He's key champion from President's Office for the Festival for Innovation. Um, he was awarded the Padma Shri in the year 2004 for his contribution to management uh, education. And his, in, his talk today will be on innovations from the grassroots for inclusive development specifically the honeybee network cross-pollinates. Welcome, Dr. Anil. <laughs> and last but not the least, I would like to welcome Geeta Gauri, former member of Competition Commission of India and director of tariffs at the Andhra Pradesh Electricity Regulatory Commission. Dr. Geeta is an economist with 15 years of experience working as a regulatory economist. This unique experience gives us the privilege of being the only economist in India to be associated with the premiering of two commissions which assured competition and market reforms in the economy. Dr. Gauri has published extensively and delivered lectures on a wide range of topics such as pricing for welfare, privatization and public enterprise, and the new economic policy and equity. Uh, her talk today is going to focus on antitrust and innovation cases, perspectives from Competition Commission of India. Welcome, Dr. Gauri. And now I'd invite Dr. Rajinder Srivastava to join us on the dais and moderate the panel. Uh, we do have presentations of some, all, most of the speakers, so do let me know and I'll pull it up. All right, uh, so before we uh, get into the presentations, I'd like to uh, take a you know, couple of minutes to uh, set the stage, if you will. And uh, then may, may I also request the panelists to uh, stick to about 10, 12 minutes so we can leave the maximum amount of time uh, for the dialogue because I think, uh, you know, a lot of uh, issues are going to be brought up by the questions, you know, from the floor. Um, so very quickly, if I just uh, look at the evolution of uh, competition, um, and, uh, you know, I've been uh, actually uh, about 40 years ago, I did my dissertation on this topic. How do you define a market? Because being in marketing, the question is what is, uh, you know, we define uh, unusual power based on things like market share. And so I was involved in the market definition issue. And at that time, the prevailing logic had been uh, based on production factors, such as the standard industrial classification code. And then, you know, there was the economic perspective in terms of cross price elasticity of demand. And uh, my work, and this is uh, admittedly four years, 40 years ago, <coughs> four decades ago, was uh, based on this issue on substitution and use. As long as uh, you know, two technologies, two products, two materials were being used for the same purpose, they were in effect uh, you know, being competitive. Uh, that has sort of given way into what I would call expansion into related markets. And uh, the idea is uh, that if you're in market A and there's an adjacent market, uh, you have a competitive advantage in, in an adjacent market relative to those who are not in, you know, in, in your field. 
And uh, that has eventually led to the evolution of ecosystems. And you know, companies like Motorola lost out to Intel, not because the chips were inferior, but Motorola had a partner called Apple in those days. And Intel, the, comp the competition, had their partners in just about everybody else, in, you know, including Microsoft. So what we learned from that is that the best product doesn't necessarily win. It's the best network product. And years ago, I saw an article. I wish I had kept a copy. The title of that article was Spider versus Spider. So it is one ecosystem fighting another ecosystem. And it was important that you were in the right ecosystem, but it was also important that you were in some sort of a nodular position in the ecosystem you were in, in order to be able to extract the rents you know, within that ecosystem. Uh, that has uh, now led to a situation where we see uh, evolution of competition really across industries. And uh, so you take Amazon as an example. It started in retailing to help the the online retailers uh, it expanded into cloud computing. And AWS became the leader. And now you've got Amazon really going into entertainment. So for those of you who are using Amazon Prime, and Amazon Prime is not just in the US, it's, you know, it's across the world. And so what we see is, uh, is the ability of organizations to actually cut across industries as we have traditionally defined them. And so we need to look at uh, ways in which uh, you know, we can therefore manage ideas that are coming out and how those uh, ideas are actually being you know, managed in the marketplace. Um, a lot of uh, very interesting dynamics are coming uh, from uh, companies like Alipay and Tencent. And uh, is Alipay a payment system? Of course it is. But they're also into brokerage, they're also into, into uh, into uh, uh, clearing uh, cross-border customs. Uh, they are also into all aspects of banking. They're into the travel business. They're all over the place. And so again, we see that data information has changed the game a little bit. And while in the old product world, we talked about product platforms, now we are seeing data platforms where one is leveraging insights related to what customers like or don't like. Uh, for companies to be able to compete across industries. And how do we manage that? So these are some of the complexities. And these are happening at very, very rapid speeds. And you know, things are getting, in fact, faster and faster. So this is the backdrop. And of course, there are differences across countries that we talked about earlier. So given this kind of a context, we have four very uh, interesting and four very different uh, perspectives. And so. Maybe start with uh, Rishi. And the, if you want to. Yeah, good morning and uh, thank you, Raj. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at this uh, conference. So, my presentation is largely about just giving you an overview of innovation in India, uh, where it stands today, where are the challenges, and what does the future look like. And this is based on work in the field of innovation that I've been doing for close to 20, 25 years now, and across some of the books that were mentioned. Uh, the current presentation I'm making, the one I'm making today, is based on work that I've done with Professor Shamin Prashantam at SEEBS in Shanghai. And it's uh, related to a paper that we published uh, recently in the Global Strategy Journal. So at the outset, I think this comment was already made that for a country of India's size and aspirations is fairly low. Uh, unfortunately, it's also been fairly static. This R&D as a percentage of GDP has been in the range of 0.8 to 0.9% for almost as long as I've been studying India and innovation. So that's certainly a challenge and one number you might like to keep in mind as we go ahead with this uh, presentation. Now, if you look at the evolution of innovation in India, What's also interesting is there is a kind of duality. There are sort of two streams which are often running in parallel and which need to meet more often. And Professor Anil Gupta, my teacher and longtime guru who is also here on the dais, has been making very 
strong efforts to bring both of these innovation systems together. The first innovation system is the one we are most familiar with. It's the formal R&D-based, science-based kind of innovation system, which was given a huge push by the government after independence as a part of India's efforts to become part of the global science and technology community. But the one which perhaps has had more impact on the country as a whole is actually the more home-based, frugal, adaptive, ingenuous kind of innovation system. A lot of it resting in the informal sector, but some of it in the formal sector as well, which has contributed a lot to health, well-being, etc. in India. And I'll come back to this point a little later. So if you look at where innovation originates today in India, one major component of it, at least again in the formal R&D sense, has actually shifted to the MNE R&D centers. So if you were to rewind about 20 or 25 years, you would have seen the biggest component of formal R&D was in the government R&D sector. It was in the labs like the CSIR, DRDU, and et cetera. But today, if you look at where most of it is happening, or at least the most visible part, it's actually shifted its locus more to the multinational R&D centers, where, of course, the centers in India largely support the innovation efforts of their parent companies. They dominate patent statistics, as I will show you in a moment. And there's been a little bit of play with the frugal approaches in the sense that they've been influenced by them, at times expressed an interest in following frugal approaches, but perhaps not really to the extent that one would have expected. The second set of innovation players is, of course, the Indian companies. And my focus is largely on industrial innovation. I'm not talking so much about innovation in outside the, uh, you know, the industrial sector. You'll see that Indian companies, again, have made sincere innovation efforts in some domains, particularly the pharmaceutical industry comes to mind. But largely within the technological frontier, it's been taking existing technologies, adapting them, building on them in new ways. They have used a number of frugal approaches. They have adapted lots of technologies. And a lot of it has been driven by the need to meet local needs of access and affordability, reflecting the kind of country we're in. There is, of course, another stream of this, which has also been significant in the last two decades, which has been the one that's been focused outside, which is largely in areas like software and pharmaceuticals, where we have a thriving export-oriented industry. The recent phenomenon, which was already mentioned and which is gaining more traction, is, of course, the growth of startups. There, I think it's probably too early to say what direction the startups are going in as far as innovation is concerned. Some preliminary work we have been seeing in India suggests that they are largely adaptive and not really, once again, pushing the technology frontier. But I think it's perhaps premature to come to a judgment on that. If I were to just sort of put all of this into some kind of a framework, I would say that innovation broadly falls in two buckets, as Raj mentioned in his introductory remarks. One is, of course, the process side, <coughs> which tends to be dominant in what we have seen in India in the past. The other is the product side, which today is largely dominated by the multinational R&D centers in India. And if you look at where is the focus, most Indian companies' focus, except in the two or three sectors I mentioned, is more inward, more driven by frugality, whereas what you see is the multinationals are more outward-oriented, much more focused on knowledge and R&D, and we have some Indian companies which are marked as EMNEs here, emerging multinational enterprises, which are actually trying to now develop strong capabilities to also be there in international markets. And I guess pharmaceuticals is the best example you could take there. I did mention the whole issue of patenting and intellectual property. And one interesting measure of how much intellectual property is being created by Indians in an international or global context is to look at the US patents awarded to Indian inventors. So when I'm talking about Indian inventors here, I'm taking the first inventor on a patent and looking at where is that inventor located. And if that inventor is located in India, I'm counting those numbers. These are the averages for different periods of time. Why were these periods chosen? Somewhat obvious, 1976 to 94 roughly represents the pre-liberalization period. 95 to 2008 is the first rush post-liberalization, roughly until the financial crisis. And 2009 onwards is, of course, the more recent kind of a phase. And what you see is overall, of course, that there's been a huge 
increase in the number of patents awarded to Indian inventors. But what is equally breathtaking in these numbers is how this is dominated by multinationals, which essentially reflects the multinational R&D centers in India. Indian companies have been increasing the numbers of patents, of course, but as you can see, they're still far behind the, what the multinationals are doing. And while the Indian research and academic institutions had a fairly big jump in the 95 to 2008 period, you see right now they're certainly not growing at the same pace at which the multinationals are growing in terms of patents. So this, the last row there tells you the whole story. Out of 3,498 patents on average per year being awarded by the US Patent Office to Indian inventors, about 2,761 are going to MNCs. And you can see the other numbers, 407 to Indian corporates and about 180 to Indian research and academia. Now, in parallel, as I mentioned, there's the other angle to this whole thing, which is the whole frugal innovation ecosystem, which, in a way, as far as Indian prosperity is concerned, as far as Indian well-being, health, et cetera, is concerned, has actually made quite a significant impact. I think Raj mentioned Arvind Iker in his uh, initial remarks. And we've seen several others. For example, you look at a company like Narayana Healthcare, pioneered by Dr. Devi Shetty, started by you know, being able to do open heart surgery or coronary bypass surgery for about $2,000. Today, they're pushing it to below $1,000. And all of this is focused, again, perhaps not so much on cutting edge technology, but really finding out better ways of doing processes so that you can really bring down the cost. So it's that overwhelming focus on frugality, which is really driving this kind of innovation. So if you look at innovation in India, it traditionally meant just producing efficiently. If you go back to the 50s, we imported technology from outside India, needed to make it work. The whole emphasis was on absorbing the technology, increasing efficiency. Products really came into the picture much later, probably in the last 25 years or so. But the good news is that even within this product domain, Indian companies have been able to hold their own in certain sectors. Transportation is a good example. One of the first sectors to be deregulated in India was the light commercial vehicle segment way back in the 1980s. Four Japanese companies entered through joint ventures. People thought it was curtains for Tata Motors or Telco as it used to be called at that time. But the surprise winner actually turned out to be a new LCV that the Tata's developed called the Tata 407 which even 25 years later today is actually still one of the dominant vehicles on the road. And a lot of it again has to go with its being rugged, easy to repair, very good value for money, essentially a product which is very well suited to Indian conditions and frugal in, in multiple aspects, particularly in the, for, from the point of view of maintenance, upkeep, running, etc. But if you look at the last 25 years, I would imagine that things have changed. One thing for sure is that firms in scale-intensive industries had to scale up. They had to enhance technology to survive. You can take a simple example like petrochemicals, where you have Reliance being one of the largest companies today, but many of the smaller companies simply folded up. Pharmaceuticals and transportation have emerged as the most locally R&D-intensive industries. Of course, the emergence of the service industry that we are all familiar with. And a lot of these companies did do innovation, though it might not have been the, at the technological frontier. If you look at it from an organizational perspective, how has this evolution happened? The main driver, at least for incremental innovation, was the adoption of quality management practices. Many people trace the origin of this to the entry of Suzuki into India when Maruti Suzuki was formed. Uh, it's Suzuki's efforts which led to the spread of these practices in the automobile industry. But in recent years, we've seen some more process changes happening. We've seen now efforts at maybe slightly bigger forms of innovation, looking at products or at least components. Uh, we have organizations like the Tata Group, and Gopi is going to be with us later in the day, where they have very serious efforts across the group to make innovation a part of the activity of every company within the group. But if you look at breakthrough innovation, if you look at those innovations which are really going to change industries or maybe change the basic economics of a particular business, we'll still largely see that those are driven by family owners where the owners themselves are very strongly involved in the innovation process. We can't imagine a nano having come out of Tata Motors without Ratan Tata's deep involvement, nor could you imagine a Scorpio coming out of Mahindra 
without Anand Mahindra's leadership and push behind the whole thing. As far as m and &E r and is concerned, I think I've already told you about the core things. A lot of m and &E r and in India is not visible in the end product because the entire end product is not designed here. So what uh, Nirmalya and uh, Panish Puranam call India Insight tends to be the way a lot of multinational R&D happens in India. It's software, it's embedded software, it's something that's inside the product so it doesn't really appear in the final product. But having started on the basis of cost arbitrage, today most m and R&D centers in India have graduated to knowledge augmentation. They have started taking on lead roles initially for legacy products, but now for new products for developing and emerging markets. There is, of course, one area where there's still some controversy. Has the multinational R&D system been more of a self-contained entity? Or to what extent have we really seen genuine spillovers to the rest of the ecosystem? One domain in which we have probably seen spillovers is in the startup domain. Increasingly, we find lots of, the, especially the tech startups, are staffed by people who have come out of many of these many R&D centers. How those startups will evolve is something we'll be watching very carefully as things go forward. In terms of startups, and this is a certainly a very ripe area for research, particularly for all our academic colleagues, uh, there's no doubt India has done very well in terms of numbers of startups. Several surveys say that India is number three or four in the world in terms of numbers. A lot of it has been driven by some of the government's efforts, particularly through the Atal Innovation Mission and the startup policy which the minister was speaking about. Luckily, we've also seen industry associations like NASCOM and large companies like Google and Microsoft also supporting the startup ecosystem. However, how many of these startups are really R&D intensive is a matter which is not all that clear. We do see some clusters around the Indian Institute of Science, around some of the IITs, but some small analysis that we did of some time ago suggested that, for example, the top nine startups in India in terms of revenues have just 30 patents between them. And most of the value they are creating seems to be by adapting global models, integrating the value chain with local suppliers, and just maybe adapting the company better to local needs rather than doing, again, once again, cutting edge technological innovation. Again, an important question which this conference may also be interested in is, what is the broader impact of this startup ecosystem? What is the impact in terms of welfare, in terms of growth, in terms of employment, we don't have good numbers as of now, but certainly these are areas we need to study as we go forward. What's different about Indian innovation? I think I've already spoken about most of it, so I won't repeat it. We've been very good in process innovation. Some sectors have been quite creative in terms of organizational innovation. Software is one that comes to mind immediately. Product innovation has largely had a frugal focus. And by and large, there's this, been this whole movement towards frugality, which is really focused on uh, addressing ISB a market which has limited tha, affordability. Tha, tha. Now, what about the Indian do innovation do tha, system? The Indian innovation system, I think, essentially has certain characteristics. One which we normally look at when we are looking at innovation system is the STEM capabilities. We certainly have large numbers, but most analysts agree highly heterogeneous quality. We have a national culture of creativity that goes back thousands of years, a hoary past. We've tried to build an SNT base post-1947. And of course, we have some of our local innovative skills as well. Uh, we have government support for R&D and innovation, which has historically been quite strong, but it's changing its nature now. A lot of the government support earlier was for supporting R&D in government labs, in government institutions. But the government's focus is now largely shifting to startups and the industrial arena. Protection of IPR, I think there's a whole session on that later in the day, but at least my sense is that one challenge of IPR in India has, that has been very healthcare focused. It certainly becomes stronger over time, at least as far as the legal framework is concerned, but how well enforced it is is something which will again be an open question for some time to come. Venture capital has certainly become available in much larger magnitude, starting from angel investors, all the way up to much longer term kind of capital, uh, private equity and so on. Uh, and there's a much more interesting international dimension now. Some of the largest so-called startups or at least largest young firms in India are today funded by international investors, not by Indian investors. Many of them are funded by investors from China. I don't know if you've been watching that 
Ch Chinese and Japanese investors seem to be driving some of the merger activity as well in that area. And what impact that's going to have on the evolution of the startup ecosystem is something we need to see. Okay, coming to the end of my presentation, what's the future of innovation in India? How do we expect it to evolve? One thing we have seen in recent times is that there have been a lot of startups in certain domains. E-commerce was the first flavor of the day. Then it became fintech. Now we're hearing more and more about artificial intelligence, machine learning, and related fields. But one question <coughs> which remains open, and I think I've posed this question earlier, is to what extent will Indian startups be able to pioneer new technologies? And to what extent will be the, they be able to take this onto the global stage so that they can actually become global leaders in their respective domains? India doesn't have a very great history of riding new technology waves. I think it can be safely said we largely missed the semiconductor wave. Nanotech also, by and large, we've been followers. Biotech, we've done a tad better. But in the past, most of the time, we have struggled to keep up with the latest technology waves. Is it going to be different this time, particularly with this new startup ecosystem we have created? That's going to determine, to a large degree, what's the future of innovation in India. I think Raj made this point earlier. It's a very important point. India has the largest base of mobile subscribers in the world. I mean, the, the other day I read there are now 1.3 billion mobile connections. But we don't have a, still have a strong manufacturing base of telecom equipment in India. It's been talked about on multiple occasions, but we don't have the equivalent of a Huawei or a ZTE or anything else, which is quite unfortunate considering the huge market which is already there in India. So can India develop technology capabilities related to its needs is a big question. The good news is there are a few companies which have developed technological competence. And I'm just going to give you two very quick examples. One company which I'm very fond of is Praj Industries, which is based in Pune. This company, more like most other Indian companies, started by importing technology. They tried to develop a continuous process for fermentation of cane molasses that is essentially converting sugarcane waste into alcohol. They found that the imported process didn't work well in India. They did a lot of adaptation. In the process, they understood a lot about how do you characterize molasses, how do you characterize waste. They became experts in process equipment to back up this whole effort. Today, they are looking at very fundamental R&D in terms of how can you do waterless fermentation, steamless distillation, zero pollution processes, and they are working on second generation biofuels. So they have made this whole transition from just being an adapter today to being a company which is trying to pioneer new technologies. I'm not saying there are hundreds of these companies, but there are at least some companies like this that give us a sense that things may be changing in the future. On the other side, let me give you an example from the startup domain. This is a company called Vigyan Labs, which was one of the winners of the NASCOM Innovation Award a few years ago. Very simple idea. Data centers today are the way most computing happens. All the stuff we do on the cloud, there are those data centers all over which do the actual computing. But data centers have been identified as some of the biggest consumers <coughs> and wasters of electric power. So can you use power more efficiently in a data center? That's the problem which Srinivas Vardarajan, the founder of Vigyan Labs, took up. And he's developed an algorithm to bring down the consumption of power in data centers by 30%. It's already being applied all over India. He has a US patent to back it up. And he's now trying to expand his market across the world. So there are examples of companies like this which are really developing new technology and trying to address global markets. Let's see how successful they are. The last point I want to make is that the m and &E R&D centers which, as I mentioned right in the beginning of my talk, are a major locus for science-based innovation in India today, are very rapidly embracing new technology. And what's happening is because of the disruptions that are taking place, because of the advent of new technologies like AI and machine learning, many companies are looking towards their Indian R&D centers to pioneer some of these activities. Because it's India where they have the largest strength of IT trained professionals. India is where they have a lot of competence in software. So they're looking at their R&D teams in India to lead these efforts. And if our teams in India are actually able to do that, 
this may mean that in the next generation of technologies, Indians will be able to drive or be at the frontier of these technologies. So that's broadly just painting a kind of overview of innovation as I see it today, based on looking at the past 25, 30 years of development of innovation in India, particularly in the industrial sector. Thank you. Thanks, Rishi. That was very, very informative. It's like 40 years and 25 minutes. <laughs> and uh, with that, uh, let me invite uh, uh, Girish uh, and uh, get the perspective from CSIR. Good morning. <clears throat> Great pleasure to be here. Um, Raj Srivastav, thank you for inviting me here and sharing ideas with uh, such brilliant company. Uh, <clears throat> I come from the Council of Scientific Industrial Research. 75 years, this government supported research and uh, innovation uh, chain of laboratories in India has given many, many contributions to the country, to the national economy. I will give you a very small bird's eye view of things that we have done in the past, but more than that, the challenge is that government R&D supported chains of laboratories like ICMR, DRDO, uh, many, many research institutes across the country, including CSR, today face. And uh, the adaptations and modifications in our thinking, in our way of approach, need that are being catalyzed, certainly from the perspective of CSR today, I will try to present before you in the 10 or 15 minutes that I've been given. <clears throat> Through its 60 or 70 years, particularly from 50s onwards, CSR uh, contributed when import substitution, for example, was a challenge. There were several technologies, starting from the indelible ink that we all use today in elections. It has great relevance even today, exported to many countries abroad. And then you have the first Indian baby food, milk-based Indian food from buffalo milk. I will not go into the details. All of these things in hindsight appears sometimes small, you know, through the rear view mirror things appear small, but at the time they were major contributions, but more than the major contributions per se, the whole ambience in national labs to create innovative solutions to national problems that got seeded. And as we moved into the 1990s where the great challenge was to get into the globalization game, the patent, you know, getting innovation, uh, into patents, uh, our director general at that time, Dr. Mashelkar, under his leadership, a new whole movement was, was, was seeded where the patent culture got into the Indian ambience. And it turned out that within 10 years or so, CSR has been the number one patent from all Indian organizations, R&D organizations. So it, there came, to a, came a stage around 2000, 2005, where we were number one always in patents. Um, <clears throat> certainly after MNCs came here, a lot of the patents came from the MNC sectors, but from all Indian organizations, including universities and R&D, CSR even today remains the number one patent filer and obtainer. Now, the challenge now has been, do we convert all this wealth into, into usable recipes, if you will? You know, you cannot have recipes don't, that don't translate to dishes, but the challenge is not in the early stage of the innovation process. Labs like CSR, which straddle aerospace, biotechnology, pharma, etc., across the decades. Incidentally, most of the lot of the innovation that in process that came in the generic pharma industry, a lot of that owes to R&D coming from CSR laboratories. Now that is part of the history. We sometimes forget history, but the opportunity here is that today, what happened in the process development in CSR today has to be transformed into product development. And the, the most important lesson that we derive from this all history is that the downstream, the downstream stage of converting innovation into products, which requires a synergy not only with industry, smartest industry, huge amount of investments, but also a mindset change in the scientists themselves. So in the last two or three years that I have been here, uh, you know, as Director General of CSR and this, with this present government, the focus has been not only startups and spin-offs, et cetera, but to bring about a synergy and a focus where sci our very best scientists convert the patent mass, the, the, the knowledge base, and the treasure house into production services. How do you do that? <coughs> I'll skip some of these slides. Incidentally mention that a lot of this patent wealth comes from a very solid base of science. 
fundamental science, target oriented science. Today CSR is among the first 100, it's the 75th, 75 position among the top R&D organizations in the whole world, not only in terms of patent, but in terms of technological visibility also. That does not mean that the challenges have been overcome. The challenge here is to convert this very rich base of national R&D labs, particularly of CSR, into production services. So therefore, as I'll show in the next few slides, <clears throat> You know, this, this slide relates to some, some of the early post-liberalization battles that CSR very visibly fought at the international arena to protect Indian IPR, especially amongst things like Haldi, products coming from traditional medicine, etc. We set up a traditional, traditional knowledge base, which is constantly used to protect Indian innovation, traditional innovation, etc. I will not dwell on this. Uh, it, it got a lot of international prominence because vast swathes of countries in Africa, across Asia, et cetera, who have a rich base of traditional knowledge in very various arenas, uh, were sensitized to the fact that our traditional knowledge not only should not be exploited by others, it should be exploited, but with credit given to the originators, but also it is incumbent on our, on our, on our countries, for example, India particularly, to use its own traditional base and take it to the masses. And that is what CSR has been doing. I'll give you a couple of examples. <clears throat> now, as you can see from this, uh, patent applications filed in India uh, overall, and this, uh, patent applications filed in India, uh, particularly uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, CSR, have been, we have been very selective. The last two, three years, we have become very selective because we don't want to actually land up with biodata patents, but patents that have value. We have a portfolio of about 3,000 patents. We are actively auditing these and sharpening these to actually convert them into useful sub technologies. <clears throat> this is some, one example I would like to give from my own research, where starting from a generic product, we moved on Cloudbusters to internationally competitive Cloudbusters, which were outlicensed, and they were smarter. So building upon a knowledge base from process development to product development and also competitive products is the game that CSR focuses on today. <clears throat> Another story, CSIR GE collaboration, which was very productive, won't dwell on it. This is an example of a medicine, traditional medicine, traditional knowledge-based medicine launched two years ago by technology developed from our CSR labs in Lucknow. And this product, which actually is an extract of six herbal uh, medicines or sources, turns out to be a blockbuster, and it is competing with some of the best with metformin. We currently are doing a, a double-blind clinical trial, uh, which, whose results will be out in a month or two. And the limited clinical trials, according to the Ayush route that were done three years ago, also showed very marked benefits to patients. And this is an example which we need to emulate <coughs> and get scientifically validated products from traditional knowledge. Few years ago, we did a value, economic value estimation of six of our technologies, including the Cloudbuster, and some technologies like water filters and vitrified tiles, which were successful commercial technologies. And we found out that the total value of these six technologies, and these are 2011-12 figures, was something like 30,000 crores. And this indicates the value not necessarily produced through the commercial channel, but societal value created out of technologies. So when we talk about patents, when we talk about uh, the technologies that are coming from national labs like CSR, the societal contribution, as opposed to monetary value created, also needs to be taken into account. <clears throat> this is one particular very recent contribution from CSR, collaborated with DBT, where blight-resistant, diabetic-friendly rice strains were developed. They are already deployed across several lakh hectares in Hyderabad, in Andhra Pradesh, in the area of medicinal and aromatic plants. A uh, lot of contributions have been made where new varieties of aromatic plants have been given to farmers, and they're at a stage two where, after these large-scale pilot studies are over, they need to be disseminated to the hundreds of thousands of farmers. Now, this brings us to a very interesting conclusion that knowledge, patents, valuable patents, 
prototypes, development of early stage technology, this part of the value chain, national laboratories are very fit to do. All of us are clamoring to reach a stage where we can be supportive of all the frugal innovation that comes out. But all the frugal innovation and all the you know, Jugad innovation is not very easy to take it to the market unless there is a synergy between national labs, the innovators, and the downstream processes where the huge amount of investment and care and conversion that is necessary to take these technologies to market in business, successful models are, is there. Now this is the biggest gap that we see today in the, in, the, in, the, in the horizon. And this is something that requires not only focused attention from scientists, technocrats, policymakers, but also rather large investments. When China, indulge, when China decides to do and cultivate and build up this value chain, especially the downstream steps, it puts in a huge amount of investment. In India, we are depending on the private sector and the private sector is also putting in a lot of interest now. We are converting our CSR labs and hopefully other national labs where the facilities and the personnel and the knowledge base is brought to synergize around key technologies. We in turn internally are developing and fine tuning our technologies so that when the technologies, the bouquet of technologies are offered to the industry, we do not land up with lemons, we do not give a lemonade. In other words, we are, for the last couple of years, we have been rather inwardly looking because we want to go ahead with technologies that will succeed. At the same time, we have become acutely aware that the convergence of the national labs and, this, and the large amount of uh, investment that the, that the nation has put has to be made available to the innovators, whether they are, whether they are startups, et cetera. What are the platforms that we need to build? For example, we have, we have just begun an innovation fund of about 400 crores with our own earnings. We want to take it to about 1,000 crores. We decided that half of this innovation fund, we will focus to societally oriented technology development, downstream steps, where easy money or rather government supported funds are not easily available. Industry is not ready to put in at the early stage. So CSR itself will take its earnings and start investing in this. Not necessarily only CSR technologies, but also from the other stream, the, 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 the startups, et cetera. <clears throat> It is well known that when you go to pharma, when you take a new molecule, or you take up prototypes in engineering sector, the downstream processes sometimes require 10 times to 1,000 times investment than the investment that went into the early stage. Now, this is a dilemma and a challenge that needs to be addressed. And I think a lot of focus has been put on the early stage innovation, which is very good. It has started a revolution in society. Academics, people who are focused on Publication-oriented knowledge generation have begun thinking seriously, participating in this dance and this particular synergy revolution where students and the young people in the colleges and the, you know, in the, in the IITs, et cetera, are turning their attention to the, to, the, to, the, to the potential of riding the innovation wave. But how do you actually fill that gap where the innovation, once standardized and shown as a proof of concept, is actually taken to the market, that chasm is very, very big, and I think we need to focus on that. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Girish. Uh, it looks like uh, we have a work cut out for us in taking mm -hmm. ideas to, from lab to market. Uh, Anil, may I now request you to come on, and then after that, uh, you know, we can tie it up with Deepa. Thanks, Raj, and thanks, dear panelists. All of them, good friends. Some, I'm going to make new friend today. <laughs> and most of them, Girish, Rishi, Raj, we have been together in different places, different times. But uh, I'm very happy that what the introduction that Rishi set in, the stage that he has set in, provides a scope for uh, appreciating different building blocks of innovation ecosystem in our country. And what Girish has said is very valuable because uh, Undoubtedly so, when we do the analysis of patent, we find the largest share of CSIR. 
only redeeming factor is that uh, the licensing rate of CSIR patents and National Innovation Foundation's patent is almost the same. <laughs> so around 10 to 12 percent is it's what CSIR high. is. Quite high. And after 900 patents that NIF has filed, our licensing rate is also the same. So we take CSIR as a benchmark and we're trying to do better. <laughs> Because, uh, and that, 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 how that spirit comes, because when he was director of IMTAC, we signed an agreement, new director has taken it forward, of how to combine the best of the formal science with the best of the informal science. And that is the crux of the matter. And I will explain why it is crux of the matter. So frugal innovations uh, are being talked about a lot around the world when we started this work in Honeybee Network 30 years ago, a nameless, faceless person comes in contact with the network and gets an identity giving voice, visibility, and velocity. Giving voice, visibility, <coughs> and velocity to the ideas of creative people is what we do. And we do it at all levels in the ecosystem, from children. In fact, that is the most exciting part of recent years when we find children as researchers. They are able to identify such need that we, the adults, experienced professionals, have taken for granted for such a long time. So children, technology students, engineers, farmers, artisans, mechanics, and even the professionals. How can we build bridges between different knowledge systems? And how can we fertilize the imagination? And since this meeting has uh, understandably so focused on many corporations, can they understand? Can they learn from grassroots innovations? Is there a synergy possible? And I will argue a great synergy is possible. There's a unique strength of Indian innovation ecosystem. India is the only country where innovations from the informal sector are part of innovation system of the country. There's no other country which does it systematically. So what are we talking about? We're talking about open innovation, reciprocal, and responsible innovation. How do we create that pathway where mutual learning takes place, seeking new ideas from all over the all segments, respecting, rewarding, and recognizing third-party innovation. I was very happy when Girish said that out of the, the innovation fund that they have created will not leverage only CSIR technology, but also the non-CSIR. That's a powerful statement that you have made today because this is the crux of the matter. This mera tera, I mean, this is mine, this is not mine. This is not true for a country of this size and this diversity. How can we draw boundaries around the ideas? I mean, ideas coming from anywhere should be able to fertilize, and I'm very happy to hear this. It's wonderful. Now there are some conceptual clarification called for. There's a lot of confusion in our country and around the world on the term that we use. So I thought it's useful to clarify in the beginning. There are three dimensions of uh, an extremely affordable innovation, which is frugal, sustainable, and inclusive. A one rupee sachet of a mouth freshener or a tea bag is very frugal, is also very inclusive. Poorest person can afford it. But if you calculate the cost of collecting a piece of plastic from 650,000 villages of our country, it is absolutely non sustainable. It's not sustainable at all. It is frugal, it is inclusive, but it is not sustainable. And therefore, we must not celebrate, we must not celebrate a frugality which puts the future generation at risk, which puts the environment at risk, which puts the circularity at risk, which would not help our society to go very far. So therefore, frugality at what cost? And that's very important. Mission to Mars, $78 million, compared to a billion dollar by anybody else, is very frugal. Frugality is not only grassroots level. Frugality can be in major missions. Very frugal, very sustainable, need not be inclusive. It doesn't address the needs of poor at all. Doesn't matter, I mean, does it have to be inclusive? No. So I'm saying that we need to be very clear about the <coughs> concepts that we use because it will help us to sharpen the policy and the institutional environment for taking this forward. So we are talking about accessibility, we are talking about affordability, and we are talking about availability. There's a drug which is very cost effective, say 10 pesos or 30 pesos. Very affordable, very accessible, Dispensary is nearby, but it's not available because supply is a stuck out. Supply chain is not working. What do we do with that innovation? So supply chains are integral part of product, process, service, and system. SS, product, process, service, and systems. And if you add platform to that, then PPSSP, product, process, service, systems, and platform. They are integral to an innovation ecosystem. We need to have 
we need to pay attention to all of them together, not one of them. Just briefly about what is the theory of social innovation? How does it emerge? And why should, therefore, be, we be able to treat them as an integral part of our pedagogy, our pursuit of success in the society at large? There are chances of failure both at all the levels. I mean, market can fail, state can fail, even civil society can fail. There are many needs which are not met. In Dhimaji, the drinking water has very high iron content. We have shown the Atras in different parts of the country, so we were walking in Dhimaji in Assam. Very high iron, iron content. The conventional filters will not work. No NGO has developed a filter. No company will develop a filter because market is limited. Market has not failed. Civil society has failed. State has failed. What do we do now? So what can happen? There are unsensed or unmet social needs. Large number of such needs exist. And if we fail to address them, they can be protest. And these protests can be disruptive, or they can be violent, they can be constructive, Gandhian, and these protests can be one driver of change for the better. They can be open innovation system, where people learn from each other, crowdfunding, sources, endogenously funded, and so on. And there can be learned helplessness, where people just feel that they can't do anything, apathy, and societies fall into the trap of learned helplessness. Don't make progress at all. There are large problems in our society with which we have learned to, to live indefinitely. And this is a problem that we need to tackle. So how do we really resolve them? This is the triangle of frugality, creativity, and openness. Frugality, short term, long term. Frugality for the customer, frugality for the nature, and frugality for the manufacturer. You can have a costly manufacturing process, but a product can be very frugal. You can have very inefficient manufacturing process. You can have a very costly process. Now, how do we bring frugality in the manufacturing process itself so that the same mindset which guides the customer should also guide the producer? We must be frugal. Now, take the case of agriculture. You have alternate row irrigation. In cotton, you give irrigation in first, third, fifth, seventh row. You reduce the water consumption by half. Pest, pest incidence also goes, by down, goes down significantly. Water is conserved. Productivity is not affected at all. This is very frugal production process and conserves nature as well. Similarly, in many other areas we can find. So we must not focus on frugality only for customer. That will not take us far. We must have frugality in the manufacturing system. I mean, if you look at the heat recovery system in various manufacturing plants which use boilers and other places, such a poor record of system. So one of the innovators, Subhash Ola, from Rajasthan, Sikha, on the way to Jaipur, has developed a boiler system. He developed it for making khoya, the milk concentrate. But now it is going into textile industry. It is going to dye industry. It is going to many, many sectors. What does it do? It recovers 60% energy because the waste, the steam that is coming out of the boiler is recycled and 80% water. Very cost effective. Very frugal process of manufacturing. Grassroot innovation, getting into big companies today because of the closed chain model that he has developed in boilers. Creativity can be constructive, destructive. You use dynamite to catch fish, very destructive. Very creative, but very destructive. It kills the small fish and also the big fish. Not sustainable at all. So we should not celebrate that anything, any creative solution is good. No, no, no. Creative solutions can be very bad for the society sometimes when they, they violate the spirit of sustainability. Openness at different stages of manufacturing process, various, various stages of design development will affect the way society learns. It can be different degrees, different stages, and how do we take it forward? Now, one of the arguments that I have been trying to make, and I will make strongly today, is that open innovation system that we have embarked upon 30 years ago in the Honeybee Network, we are the largest provider of open source content on the net. You go to web. You will not find even 500 innovations from any one place at FAO, UN. You go to any site. We have got 15,000, 20,000 of them available on the website with name and address of the people who have solved those problems. Now, we have this tradition, very long tradition. Many of you might have seen these cave paintings in Bimbeteka. This fellow is telling me how to make a human figure. There is a triangle. Then there's an, you close the two, two loop. So you are now a two triangle, the inverted triangles. Put a circle on the top. You have now a human figure. You can have arms, you can have legs. A teacher was tell, teaching us <coughs> 30,000 years ago how to make a human figure, and I can get the same message today. 
this is the tradition of teaching and open, open teaching in our country. Before civilization was born, before languages were born, before communities as we know today were born. Why has this tradition become so weak? This is the reason why it has become weak. Our download to upload ratio is terrible. If I ask all of you to just write down the ratio on a piece of paper last week, it will be embarrassing, isn't it, for many of us? It will be embarrassing because we have downloaded a lot of content. We have not uploaded our ideas. We have not uploaded our papers. We have not uploaded our students' projects. And how can this country, which wants to be a leader in the world, become the greatest consumer of knowledge, but not producer of knowledge? Girish, this is something that we must ask every day. We must ask every day, in every lab, in every school, in every college, in every industry, what is our download to upload ratio? Girish, Krishnan, you have to get it done in nine. Please insist that when students write assignments, <coughs> upload it, please. Let the whole world evaluate it. Why should only teacher evaluate it? If it is useful, it will go into circulation. People will talk about it. And if it is not, we will ignore it. Let the world judge. Let there be an appraisal by billions of people rather than millions, rather than only 60 people or few teachers. <coughs> so this is very important. And to solve this problem, we created a database called Techpedia, techpedia.in or techpedia.sashi.org. It has 200,000 entries on engineering projects done by 550,000 students of our country. The biggest database of its kind. You want to look up what Stanford and Harvard or MIT students have done projects in engineering, you wouldn't find them in one place. You can find them in India. IITs, ISER, various institutions. Why have we done that? Because we want originality. If students don't know what other students have done, how will they be original? They can't go to 7,000 engineering colleges to find out who is doing what. The cost, transaction cost is so high. Innovation. If I know what others have done, I can build upon it. A cocoa model, a relay model of creativity, where we can build upon each other's ideas, and we can link the MSME, because MSME can't afford. Mr. is sitting here. He knows how much I struggled with him and his predecessors in the ministry. That please understand that the clusters of small-scale industry need, can't do R&D on their own. Who will do R&D for them? Our students will do R&D for them. They can use these ideas. I have created one more database recently, which we have not yet released. We have made a database thanks to a student, Zaigam and Devika, two students from IIM Nagpur who are taking my class. And they have downloaded all abundant patents from USPTO. All abundant patents. We are going to make it an open source. Now, these abundant patents are very useful for our industry because they're open source. They are no more IPRs applicable, but they're recent technologies. Some were abandoned seven and a half years ago, some 11 and a half years ago, and this will be one of the contributions that Honeybee Network will make to revitalize the productivity and efficiency of our small scale sector, done by just two students who felt inspired. So we need to create this policy of or practice of searching innovation, spreading innovation, celebrating innovation, and sensing the unmet needs. If we make an inventory of unmet needs all over the country, this will spur a huge lot of innovation. And how does it happen? Let us see that. So this is a girl, she was at that time in class eight, recently at Festival of Innovation and Entrepreneurship, Shalini was present. She gave an idea that her, the walker could not climb the stairs. Her grandfather, using walker, couldn't climb the stairs. Actually, they couldn't climb the stairs in US, in Europe, everywhere in the world. The walker around the world do not have adjustable leg. Our team in National Innovation Foundation, Fab Lab, made this walker. License to a company, few lakh rupees went as a license fee to this girl, youngest entrepreneur of our country, and she gets royalty on the sale of every walker. This walker now will have shorter leg when you climb up, taller leg when you climb up. Simple idea. Did not happen around the world, anywhere. You will not find such walker anywhere. Friends will justify that, it will be in for that. Now, that means that there is a possibility of creating globally useful products by using our own mind. This lament that we often have, that we have V2 project, which is, which is what Rishikesh mentioned very clearly, that many of our startups are Me Too kind. You know, they're not breaking new ground, and which is rather unfortunate. They generate jobs, no doubt, so we welcome them to the extent that they're providing growth to our society, but they are not enough. This is a very interesting idea. I was talking to the Cisco R&D team from around the world in Bangalore, and I gave this example to them. I said, look, you are the world leader. You have 70% market share in the routers. You have 70,000 employees. But look at how we look at IoT and how you look at IoT. The IoT is machine-to-machine -machine communication. 
But this girl, Divya, who sent me a very simple idea that my pets get stressed and I need to get a message that I have, because of my exam, I couldn't play with her and I need to go and play with her. I said, that's an interesting thought. So why can't we have IoT? Instead of IoT, we have IoTTF, Internet of Things, Thoughts and Feelings. My plants are getting stressed because I have not irrigated them. My pets are getting stressed because I have not played with them. My grandparents are stressed because I didn't call them for the last two weeks. And we want a society where there's a space for human and non-human sentient beings, all part of our Samvedanshil society. They're all part of my being, isn't it? I can't live without them. So therefore, why do I restrict to a notion of machine-to-machine -machine communication? Why not machine-to-human communication? And make that part system very sensitive. This is another very interesting example of how machine-to-human interaction can take place. Many of you are not sitting properly just now. You know, you're not sitting properly. I'm sorry. I'm telling you that we, the adults, don't realize that we have lower back pain because we don't sit properly. I'm sure I have had it three, three times, and many of you must have had this pain. Unfortunately, I can't. Because we don't sit properly. So the children, Kulsum Rizvi, class fifth. Tarun from Hardoi, class 10th, independently sent us an idea. Sir, chairs should have pressure sensors. If you don't sit properly, the skin will go blank. Sit properly, I will not let you do work. Now, that's the screen we want on our computers, on our laptop, on our... Isn't it? Now, who has identified this need? We have a problem, but we didn't identify the need. Children are identifying the need. To me, this seems most exciting model of innovation, where our children will do research. They will identify the need. They will give us this trigger, and we, out of our embarrassment, then will be obliged to make such chairs and make such solutions possible. So we have these show the atras where we walk different places. We learn from four teachers, teacher from within, teacher around, teacher in nature, and teacher among common people. <coughs> I have walked one round along with my other friends in Honeybee Network, all these states of the country. We are now begun second. Last walk was in Guraj Valley. There were six children at the Rashpati Bhavan recently from 19th to 23rd of March who came, who were discovered in Guraj Valley. And one of the kids, very little kid, small Khurshid, he, Mujaffar his name was, and he said, Sir, there should be a pen which can count number of words. Teacher says, write in 100 words. Now mm -hmm. I have to ch count every after some time how many words I have written. That takes a lot of time. And we designed a small pen. But this kid was a smart. You know, many times we have to fill up things and number of words. In computer, you can count the word very clearly. But how do you count on the notebook? It's not easy. So let there be a pen which can count number of words. Little kid, Goraj Valley is in the northern part of our India, close to Kargil where 20 feet of snow covers that area. We were walking there. There is a kid thinking about this kind of an idea. And that spurs. And that idea will be applicable all over the world once it comes out. So these kids are very smart. This is one innovation we found in Baripali, Burger district. Kurta without a stitch. I wear kurtas. And they have many stitches, you know. On, in the arms, you have stitches. In the collar, you have stitches. You have stitches here. But this kurta does not have a single stitch. Can you imagine the, the skill, the innovation in this? Can you conceive for a minute how can a kurta be woven on a loom which will be so designed that it can weave the whole kurta, cylindrical object, on a vertical two by two loom? That's extraordinary innovation. Only of its kind. You can't find that second piece of this kind. Incidentally, Baripali is also unique for another reason. There are four districts I have found which do not have malnutrition. Mahindragad, Barpali, Anantnag, and Kurej. And Barpali is having no malnutrition in Orissa, though it's one of the poorest children, because mothers breastfeed their children up to two years, three years, up to four years sometimes. And they have a small vegetable garden, everybody, no matter how poor they are. These two factors explain how we tackle the problem of malnutrition. 43% children of our country are malnourished between age one to five. 43% children of our country. So there are solutions available in various spaces of our life, not just uh, technology. There are four levels that we can learn from innovation. Artifactual level, analogic level, heuristic level, and just alt. As we go down, the level of abstraction is increasing. The replicability is also expanding. So artifactually, a windmill may be only used as a windmill, maybe for pumping water, brine water, or for pumping irrigation water, but it's still artifactual. Windmill to windmill. One context to another context, but the same object. Analogic. You all know about Velcro example. Metaphorical. Heuristic, a thumb rule, where you have not using replicating innovation, you're replicating the lesson underlying the innovation. 
the principle that you are lying under there. And Gestalt is a configuration of various factors. So very interesting. We found this, many of you might have gone to Himalayan region, you have gone to Sikkim or other places, you find these prayer flags that Buddhists put. The requirement for a prayer flag is, if you really wish, and that wish you want to be fulfilled as belief goes, then the prayer flag must flutter all the time. That means, if you map the prayer flags, you have mapped the wind corridors. Now, if you want to install windmill, go to a place where prayer flags are flying. That's an analogic example. How do you use the, the, the metaphor of prayer flag for something else totally different? This is a, uh, one of the fantastic innovations developed by society. It takes 50 years to build this bridge of tree roots, and it lasts for 500 years. I was talking, traveling today morning with Sudhi Jain, director of INT Gandhinagar, a very eminent engineer, civil engineer of our country. And I asked him, Sudhir, how many projects do we have in civil engineering which take 50 years to complete and will last for 500 years? We all marvel at the architecture of Taj Mahal or whatever building that we have, but we have stopped making Taj Mahals. We have even stopped aspiring to make Taj Mahals. We will make them if we aspire, but we are not aspiring that. So as very rightly he mentioned, and many of us recognize this problem in our life, there is an aspirational deficit in the society. When you have an aspirational deficit, how do you bring the techn technological innovation of the kind that will transform the society? So there is need to make up. Why did this bridge come about? We asked the people, we were walking in that Meghalaya, sir, we wanted to make a bridge which was different. We didn't want to make a rope, rope bridge, we didn't want to use the wood, we didn't want to use iron. All right, so, you, so culture is the first culprit. It generates curiosity to be different. We want it to be sustainable. So we found trees on both sides of the river which had roots similar to rope. We thought we can pull them, technology. But we can't pull them alone. We need a group action, institution. So technology is like word, institutions are like grammar, culture is like thesaurus. We need all the three for an ecosystem. I'm happy that Rishi mentioned in his conclusion, many ideas, either they were applicable to institutions or they were applicable to the policy or they were applicable to the culture. And we need to bring all the three together, all the three together. Another example of how societies think far. We were in Purulia, found these beautiful terracotta horses lying under a tree. We asked the people, potters, why, why did you keep such beautiful horses under a tree? Somebody can take it, somebody can break it. By the time they knew I was a professor, you have done a mistake. I said, what mistake did I do? We haven't kept the most beautiful ones. We have kept the best ones. Why did you keep the best ones? So that when our children walk by this street in the morning to school, they know what the current standard of the best craftsmanship is. They must do better. Open source standards of excellence. This is how our society teaches excellence. It is not that we don't have those in that, in that instrumentality, that those principles of teaching and learning in our society from which we can't, on which we can't build upon. So when I'm talking about grassroots innovation system, grassroots knowledge system, I'm not talking about them just for the sake of finding some small tinkering solution. I'm talking about fundamental assumptions of how we live and how do we grow and how do we grow as a society. Those fundamental assumptions can be modified if we learn from those grounds. This is another example of a very flexible, friendly, frugal innovation. But what is remarkable about that, we transfer this technology to Kenya, along with two other, food processing and enabler. Kenya Bureau of Standards, CAPS, JKUAT, Jomo Karnata University of Agriculture Technology, in October when I went there, met together, he said, look, if you don't develop standards for a small tractor that we have transferred you, then it will not be registered. If it is not registered, then banks will not give loan against it. If banks don't give loan against it, it will not diffuse. 90% tractors in our country, many of you might know, are financed by banks. 90%. Now, look at the ecosystem, therefore. How critical the role of standard is. And I find this is one area which is neglected drastically by innovation researchers. We must, we must expand. I tell you, two weeks ago, I was in Kenya. They had a stakeholder meeting where they presented the standards and the standards were designed for a range of choices. That was the beautiful part because they realized that if we want to trigger innovations in different agroclimatic regions, that then the axle length, for example, depends upon the inter-row distance between the two crops. How can you have the constant axle length? You see the point? Mm -hmm. How advanced the Kenya Bureau of Standards is compared to our Bureau of Standards? Mm -hmm. 
they designed standards to keep to enough space enough scope for future innovations that is the kind of standards we need not the standard of the past a standard freezes the innovation space please understand standards have a great role but they also bound the space for innovation every standard is a boundary within which you have to innovate if you make the flexible standard you expand the boundaries and that is the lesson that they taught us so there is a very important role that standards play we must not forget this is another interesting how do we learn new heuristics in meghalaya you have four shelves above the kitchen above the cooking stove what is the concept concept is that the temperature gradient as the smoke goes up it gets becomes cooler if it becomes cooler what is the functional advantage of temperature gradient i can't use the smoke of the same heat for all the purposes so for fumigating my seeds on the top i need much less temperature but gases to disinfect my seeds so that pests don't attack for storing cheese and meat i need to dry them at a particular temperature for drying the wood in meghalaya cherapunji because there is lot of rain i need to have a higher temperature but if i have to cure the wood i need highest temperature wood last longer when it is cured multiple can we teach something about how to use energy i don't think so in our kitchens there is no mechanism of using the heat gradient above the shelf of the gas there is nothing else these are lessons that we can with the whole kitchen system of our world can be redesigned if you have leftover vegetables keep it on a shelf above the gas it will get dried up they will become snacks for your next snack so we have this festival of innovation and entrepreneurship that our new president earlier it was called festival of innovation now it has become festival of innovation and entrepreneurship a great contribution by shri ramnath kovind ji because obviously innovations are not enough they must convert into entrepreneurship they give these awards in techpedia this is a award book and i will just mention two example two or three examples you know tb is a major problem there is a commitment of the nation that by 2025 we must eliminate tb from our country but tb can only be eliminated if you can diagnose it the ordinary microscope cannot diagnose it you need a fluorescent microscope fluorescent microscope costs about 3 to 5 lakh rupees here is a team of students led by vikas from it delhi they have made a 10000 rupees microscope with an attachment of 10000 rupees into a fluorescent microscope now you can diagnose tb at the every primary health center look at this brilliant innovation for grassroots level this is innovation for grassroots not from grassroots for grassroots but it is no less important an ecosystem need both we were so flabbergasted i mean this is such a great idea that fellow has been given 15 lakh rupees scholarship grant from sashti and bayrek bayrek is the biotechnology industry research assistance council which i had written the concept note years ago and these two bodies came together sashti is a volunteer organization of part of anibi network and we give 15 fellowships of 15 lakh each now many of you sitting here can be the mentors can be the investors can be the partner to take these innovations forward another example low cost diagnosis of pneumonia very simple item address another example of very interesting this when you have injection in your in your uh, veins sometimes vein is not easily to find out you know you must have seen people tapping that person who comes to collect blood he taps your hand tries to figure out the vein and sometimes he punctures two three times <laughs> now this vein detector iit bombay just immediately there's an infrared scope he puts the light here the vein emerges emerges because the color of the blood in the vein is different immediately the vein is visible now there is a single puncture injection will be given to you i am so happy to mention to you that few days ago our president who had inaugurated the exhibition given this award while in the morning walk recalled it and he told his physician please get that vein detected in our dispensary at the rashwati bhavan i wish every patient in the rashwati bhavan will have only one prick and not many hmm. that kind of patronage by the head of the state makes a big difference it made our day immediately i called up the it bombay i said please send this vein detector immediately to rashwati bhavan the rashwati bhavan uses it everywhere probably it will get used so now you imagine simple simple problems are being solved by these students and who say that we are not doing globally divya and others at iit hyderabad have developed a very interesting blood microfluidic biochip for diagnosing malaria at the point of care so a lot of good work is being done let me come to the last part how do we build finally bridge between the formal and informal system so this is an open innovation playground where you have two dimensions inside out and outside in inside out is what do i want to share with the rest of the world outside in what i want to learn from outside so if both are low 
That means the company doesn't want to learn from this grassroots level. And grassroots level people don't want to learn from company. Then there is an ostrich kind of mindset. We will remain doomed. No future. But if we have, we are willing to learn from outside, crowdsourcing, PNG and many other companies are very keen to learn from outside. But they wouldn't tell you what they did with it. $10,000 we have paid, matter is closed. If I made a million, I'm not saying you share that million. At least tell me that you made 100 million out of that 10,000 rupees worth of an idea. My confidence as a knowledge provider in my idea will go up. Next time, I will be more conscious of what ideas come to me. Reinforce my self-confidence at least. That much feedback you can give me. I'm not asking for money. They will not do that. Uh, incidentally, the first crowdsourcing competition took place in 1929. A small footnote, Gandhiji announced a competition and an award of 7,700 pounds, which was the one lakh rupees at that time. Today it will be 10 crore. Garish, we must have an award of 10 crore someday for design, redesigning the spinning wheel. Look at that announcement. If you read, it is available at gyti.fadia.in. You can read that announcement. It's a beautiful document of one page about how to announce a crowd competition. He gives the weight boundary. He gives the yarn count boundary. How much yarn the count should the yarn be? He says that the lady who's using the spinning wheel should not get tired after four hours of use. It should be easy to move from one place to another. It should be easy to repair. The total cost should not be beyond this 400 rupees, whatever, 40 rupees or whatever amount it is. How much should be the maintenance cost of the whole year? All this he has written down in 1929. And he says, if you want to have a patent, you can have it. But if you want the award money, you will have to assign the patent to Khadi Prayog Samiti so that it becomes an open public good. So much of insight, 1929. We didn't have a crowd competition of that kind till recently. Now look at the pollinator. These are, this, this is the group which has a great deal to share with others but doesn't need to learn from others. Tesla, it opened all its patents. It opened all its patents. Not afraid because it wanted more of charging station. Charging station will not be set up only for one company. It wanted competitors to come in the market so that the market for electrical vehicles goes up. That is a stuff that big leaders are made up of. They can think far ahead. They know that by the time you use my existing patented technology, I would have come something with new. And therefore, I will always be ahead of the curve. These are, this is the confidence the leaders have. And of course, the last one is where both are high. You want to learn a lot. You want to share a lot. This is called DBDB, Dil Bala, Dimag Bala. These are, this can only be done by those who have big heart and big mind. Those who are not afraid, who are not timid, they are the ones who will share a lot, who will learn a lot. So this is the last case of a mind to market thing, uh, how we pooled the knowledge of six communities, developed this drug. When it was launched by the company, we invited all the six people. And that's how this uh, process will go. It will be reciprocal. It will be responsible. It will be respectful. It will be open innovation driven system. What we do is we share the formula. So if you want to make this cream yourself, make it. But if you don't want to make it and buy it, buy it from us. So that open source and the patented technology can be combined. We have made sales all over the, all the inhabited continents, all over the world. There's a market for grassroots. So G2G model is working. We got queries from our 70 countries last year. G2G, grasses to global. Let me come to close. This book came out last year, uh, maybe of interest to some of you, on minds on the margin are not marginal minds. That's what I've tried to demonstrate, that there's a lot of new science and technology, new concepts, new heuristics, new analogies, new assumptions, new philosophies can be generated by listening to people and learning from them. And if you do want to learn from them, this is the ecosystem of innovations, Sashti, Gyan, and IF. And finally, creativity counts, knowledge matters, innovations transform, and incentives inspire, but not just material incentives, also non-material incentives, recognition, respect, and not just individual incentives, also collective incentives. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was inspiring. <laughs> Gita. You know, we've heard such interesting and inspiring lectures, um, not just from Anil, but Girish, also from Krishnan, and of course, Raj set the ball rolling. And perhaps I might sound a little mundane coming down into looking at markets, but Raj, that is your subject too. And what has been very important in all of these that I understand why my lecture comes at the end of it, my presentation is that it's very important to create a market. 
You have to create an open market. You have to create new markets. And the important point of this is openness. And therefore, when the Competition Commission was set up, it was set up for creating new markets, which is different from MRTP. And this becomes interesting, although I might sound a little, a little mundane or maybe a little restrictive, and some of you might have heard this, uh, my views earlier, but I am obsessed because I think the Commission was set up to try and allow for what all the earlier speakers spoke about. And if the Commission does not succeed in it, it becomes structureless. It becomes an impediment. Now, having stated this, it's interesting that you can have innovations at different levels. While Anil might talk about those from the grassroots level and how it can be incorporated, there's also a lot what Girish brought out or what uh, Krishnan brought out from taking it from the corporate sector and how they learn. I know you do, did mention Tesla. And it is the way the commission looks at its job, which is no doubt an antitrust commission, the competition commission, but there are different ways that we will look at it. And therefore, I have, looked, I have put this as perspective from antitrust cases of Competition Commission of India. But more important, I want to emphasize the aspect of incentives and liabilities. If the signals that don't come out from the commission look at incentives probably, and they only look at it in terms of a short viewpoint, you're creating liabilities. And liabilities do not encourage innovation. They do not encourage <coughs> invention either. <clears throat> now, to get back to something which is familiar, because there was a lot of lawyers, I said we look at law and economics, and both law and economics <coughs> is a strong relationship. Both function with bounded rationality. Law is based on economic theories, therefore my emphasis on incentives and liabilities, whether we look at patent law or competition law. There is the traditional argument that patents law create monopoly, and therefore open to CCI, that's the Competition Commission of, Inter, uh, of India, to intervene. But whether this is true in the case of digital spaces and ICT. When I come to the case studies, it'll bring me closer to what I was talking about, openness. But just a little bit of why the Competition Commission has a critical role to play. Now, markets function on incentives. And in high-tech matters, and I find now from other people's speeches, in all other markets, incentives have to be very, very sharp. If decisions of the commission affect the basic incentive mechanism, then the liabilities fall on consumers, and the liabilities fall on the economy. And by consumers, I mean the startups, and I mean consumers like all of us, and I mean the general consumers of 1.3 billion users of mobile networks. Those are the consumers we have to think of. So you cannot have disincentives bringing up. Now, there are two approaches that are open to antitrust authority when it comes to patents law, or comes to trying not just patent laws, to IPR, the intellectual protection rights is to treat the exercise as a case of abuse of dominance and therefore enable the exercise of market power. We're sort of obsessed that anything dominant will result in abuse. This is a hangover from our last 70 years. And then as regulators, which I was trying to argue yesterday, we all think we're small gods in our own way. We can control the market, we can control the, uh, the company, and we're exercising what we think is appropriate. And also, by extending the liability, you're creating disincentives, you are creating uncertainty, you're losing out on predictability, which is very important for new ideas to come in. Now, at the commission, some of the cases relating to IPR law and IPR are still very new. I'll take some of the earlier decisions to emphasize my point. And I know mine is coming out to be a nice, sedate lecture with no beautiful photographs. And Anil has got the most beautiful paintings. And it's almost like going to a heritage lecture with all the cave paintings. I'll try next time, if I can get some better photographs put up. But when you look at the Competition Act, it talks about three sections. One is section three, which talks about agreements, horizontal and vertical agreements. And this is where your IPR comes in. You have section four, which talks about unilateral conduct or exercise of market power through abuse of it. And of course, there mergers and acquisitions. 
Now, what does Competition Act talk about? The competition law does not require you to increase competition. That is not the business of competition law. The antitrust or competition law is only interested in trying to remove behavior that would restrict competition. That is, it only prohibits behavior that lifts competitive constraints on market power. And therefore, we do not have anything in the Act which says of competition. There may be things like appreciable effect on competition, which means the Commission cannot look at dominance, but the Commission has to look at a much wider approach and a focus that comes in. It's very easy to look at the competition, uh, competitive process in terms of negatives. Oh, there are higher prices, there's predatory pricing, but is this the intent of the Act? Now, competition policy, unfortunately, as I said, having come from the Electricity Regulatory Commission, we were bigger gods than we were in the Competition Commission because we set tariffs there does not give the regulator the power to decide how a market should function. It's not the vision that I want the market to function that way, because the market has its own rules and it should be allowed to function. And it is important, therefore, to understand how the market functions rather than imposing one's own vision. Now, in this case, just a very quick thing before I go to two cases which become controversial and interesting is, that there is a tendency for all the cases that come to the Competition Commission to come as cases of abuse of dominance. And all the cases invariably, except for one Shamsher Kataria, is filed by competitors in the Indian domestic market. Why? Because they don't want to compete. They want to use the Competition Commission to get a better deal. Perhaps it may have to do with either the case that they are fighting, and largely these are cases against the international companies. But it again shows a certain way of not being open and taking up the challenge. And this is the challenge all the other speakers have spoken about. Now, Section 4, which is the abuse of dominance, has the advantage of being per se. If a company or an enterprise is found to be dominant, then per se it is abusive. Therefore, if an enterprise has a patent law, it automatically becomes dominant and therefore can be abusive and therefore the commission could intervene. It's a sort of linear way of looking at it. There's no question of looking how competition emerges, how the market functions, and where are the incentives and liabilities fall, because it's not to encourage competitors who are not willing to compete. On the other hand, when you look at section 3.4, which is where the patent laws and all come in, the dominance is such that if you are a dominant firm, it's axiomatic to say you'll be dominant vertically. Now, section 3.4, I'll just take one minute to explain to you, deals with what are known as verticals. That is, the firms that are set up down the line. And therefore, if there is a person who has a, a, a center which is going to sell off spare parts, or you have a center which is going to have servicing center, those are the verticals. And Daniel has come in at the right moment to hear me out and to support me later. Now, when a company is dominant horizontally, it is possible and it is true that it will be dominant vertically. But these are separate markets. I'm continuing to emphasize this because this becomes important in the case studies that I look up. But being dominant horizontally would mean per se dominant vertically could have some efficiency criteria. It might be better for my software to be handled by only some group of people. It might be better that when I have agreements with companies who are selling my product that they know how it has to be used. Those are the efficiency conditions that are coming up. Now, when the patent law comes in, the idea that there is dominance was fine in the drug center, but I am talking about the ICT and the digital spaces, because I think this is where India has the comparative advantage. We not only have the brains, but we also have the data that goes into it. 
And my concern is with things like standard essential patents, which shows that this is a group of patents put together and they're competing with each other, so the question of dominance doesn't arise. Um, there's also a section in the competition law which is called the safe harbor section of 3.5 that combines with the protection. Now, having given you all this background, the only last thing I want to say is that in India, because it is a question of harmonizing patent law with competition law and looking at the process of innovation, this is something I think Girish would be interested in knowing that the problem is that if the patent law is not registered in the country, it is not accepted. Similarly, the question that comes up is that you have copyrights, you have trade designs, and if these are not registered in India, they're not accepted. And the third thing is there are certain agreements between you and me as partners in a firm and those are not some things that need to be registered but they need to be honoured or given sanctity too. So what happens in such a setup where patents are being restrictive and the competition law is obsessed with dominance and domestic competitors, you can have three outcomes. You can have a very legalistic approach. Patents are not recognised in India the uh, copyrights are not recognized in India and trade secrets should be shared. That's a very legal approach. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it, but you don't encourage innovations, you don't encourage openness. You could have a slightly more modified version, say, we do accept some of the designs and patents and copyrights, but the extent of liability should be limited. Or the large section where you say, let's be more proactive and see how the market responds, which is a step most regulators are afraid to take because they think they know the market better than anyone else. Future markets, I'll skip this because all of you have no future markets. There are just three case studies, given my short time, that I want to bring about and what I'm worried about. We had a case on the automotive sector and the automotive spare parts sector, which deals with vertical restraints and IPRs. The automotive sector is the car segment, 15 to 17 manufacturers in India. They have their verticals where they have their equipment suppliers and servicing centers. These could be in India, these could be outside India, whatever it is, there's a change that follows with one market and lower markets. So the commission, we created a new market called the aftermarket. What is the aftermarket? Aftermarket is where after you bought the car, you want to go buy spares, you want to have it serviced, and these aftermarkets should be left open. Now, it is interesting because the case came as an abuse of dominance. So if Maruti is dominant in its spares and services market, it's axiomatic. I mean, uh, Maruti will be dominant in its spares, like Hyundai will be dominant in its spares, and so will Mercedes. That's not saying anything much. But the commission looked at it as an abuse under Section 3.4, so they denied all patents, they denied all copyrights, and they decided that patents, copyrights, and all trade secrets should be shared. Why? Because people who want to come in, either there are service centers, new people wanting to enter the market, or new equipment manufacturers want to use the benefit of getting patents without working for it, getting trade agreements without working for it, and creating this sort of situation. Now, the sharing thing, when I looked at it, and I've said, that I see, please, I'm looking at it in terms of incentive and liabilities, and what is it that it creates? It creates a dilution of intellectual property rights over designs, over creativity, sanctity of trade secrets is lost, enforcing co companies to divulge their strategies. Now, you know, while we say there could be a patent, while we do agree on terms of openness, but if there is something, a person has come up with an idea, give recognition even if it's a little boy, and that's what I like about Anil saying, this little boy who gets a recognition. That is what is important, and that has to be shared. And everyone is used to, entitled to use it. The person who came up with the idea should get some return. I mean, we cannot ignore that. 
And this is where the automotive sector with its spare part came out, where the whole decision that everything has to be shared means we are encouraging copying rather than innovation. We're not letting uh, uh, people compete first, and we're not forcing people to be more innovative and come up with ideas. I know I talk about the corporate sector, but this goes right down to the entire stream that's taking place. It erodes strategies to meet competition and eroding the growing hub of ma car manufacturing in India. And what is more important, the automobile sector is becoming like the mobile phone sector, which requires a lot of AI, it requires the question of having um, not only AIs, but in terms of SCPs and standard essential patents. And then what happens is that's where the Indian strength comes in. And then, of course, there's uncertainty for foreign investment. Now, let me come to the next case, which I'm very worried about, because everyone thinks it was a beautiful decision, the case of Google. And I. Uh, fortunately for me, the automobile case, I left before they came out the order. They came out two days after I left the commission. The Google case, I didn't have enough time to argue about it. What is the Google situation? Google is a search engine. Where did they find the abuse? They found the abuse in what is known as a website, which is an intermediary service, which Google has for providing its consumers different information. And they use, and Americans have a tendency, sorry, Keith, to use phrases which we look at it slightly differently, and they called it a vertical. But a vertical is not the same as the vertical between, say, a cement and a limestone. It's just a vertical because it's something you click twice, and you, you'll be able to know, get the website, and the consumer knows where it is to go. Google is a platform. It is Google is an aggregator, it's a general search engine, it is a platform, but they define the market as an online search engine and an online advertising market and not as a platform which earned its revenue from advertising. And then what was the interesting thing about this multi-sided market was the allegation was that the algorithms of Google is biased towards its own property in terms of getting these websites. Now, the way Google picks up all of you know, they can do it either on an online general search or there can be someone who pays for the advertising in terms of an intermediate online intermediate service charges and then it comes on and you can search. And the argument that was given is Google created what is known as a Google flight in India. Then the interesting thing comes up is, and the point that I have been trying to bring up is, how does one define a market? Is a market on a platform? Is a vertical, which is a website, or whether it's online, or whether the Google has found it, is that a vertical in terms of a cement and uh, limestone? Or is it something that Google is trying for consumers to just get its its information as quickly as possible. But then on top of it, when a market definition becomes difficult, it means that we have to re-understand how to define the market. And abuse was found in a market which was not even defined. Now, having stated this, the argument that Google came up, uh, the commission came up was that Google restricted the competition for all these verticals who were doing advertising in the website. These advertisements would come out on the net using the Google search bar. And in this Google search bar, by putting Google flights, people like makemytrip.com or eboo and all will come lower down. But the aggregator Google is not a market because he does not buy and sell tickets. It's only a search engine. It just tells you which are the places you can look for. And as good consumers, what do we do? We go all the way down. And therefore, people tell me, oh, you're a Google fan. I said, no, I'm only a fan which gives me the information very quickly. Just as much as I like uh, Microsoft um, Windows and MS Office only because I don't know how to use open sourcing. I don't know how to use R. My mind is not for that. So I want to use what is easy. But more important, look at it in terms of what does the consumer lose? What does a startup lose? Startups in India use Google. They are on the part of the general online search. 
And they have websites. They may not even advertise and be part like makemytrip.com. They may be a small travel agency. And Google might pick it up because it is not search neutral. It finds those sites, those websites, which the consumer is looking for. So who loses out? And when you have apps, you have innovations, even your honeybee network would get picked up in Google. And let it be picked up. I mean, it doesn't matter. Google may be big, Google may be small, Google may die, Google may live. That's not the important thing. The important thing has this been kept open and therefore bringing an abuse of dominance on a market that is not defined of going out of your definition of market and suggesting that it was anti-competitive is very difficult to accept. And on top of it, they brought in restrictions like they did in the automobile sector, saying that the agreements that such, um, such websites, there are two types of agreements, online and offline. I know I'm making it very confusing, but these network things have very complicated ways of doing it. But in this online intermediary search, there is something known uh, which is interesting, called a substantially similar clause. That the commission found as an unfair agreement. So if I have to choose to be advertised not only in Google, but to get a position on it, I should be allowed to put all competitors of Google on the same thing. So it's a sort of saying, you know, it's like, you know, I call my competitors to kill me, variety, by having this kind of clause that takes place. But what was it? that the facts get ignored. The facts got ignored er earlier in the automotive sector, that agreements are negotiated settlements. There's a choice for consumers to go online. There's a choice for the patrons or these websites to go onto another site. And there is no evidence that the general consumer has benefited. I want to stop with Google here because there's a lot in Google. But in terms of economic analysis, the platform market was not understood. The network economics, which we started with the NSC case, was ignored. Verticals were not understood. Search neutrality or net neutrality has not been understood. Try misfired on net neutrality. Competition Commission has misfired on search neutrality. Perhaps because of the language that is used in the American context, we have to understand that. And to think that two clicks makes it a separate market is kind of stretching the imagination very far. The last one is the question of SEPs and licensing arrangements, which I will leave it as slides here because we have people, we have uh, Sheetal, Ericsson, we have Qualcomm, we have Apurva, and all of them which deal with SEPs, and this is the ICT sector. And the point is these are cases that are before the commission on Ericsson. Are they dominant? You find that there's so many companies that are coming up. More important, these are SEPs with FRAN, and they have been, uh, they've been uh, provided a standard fixed by stand SSOs or international standard setting organizations. A point you made, you have to have standards. And if you have standards with patents in the corporate sector, you have to have standards for everything, including standards for teaching. And for setting up these standards, everyone has to be involved. And this is what is important that has to be taken into account. So my question and what I want to leave for discussion here, which is slightly different, is when we talk about innovation, when we talk about the atmosphere or the ambience to allow innovation to occur, we must also allow for a climate which is open and markets which will allow for such to take place. It cannot fall into a populist argument saying this is, these are big players and the small players get crushed because there are other ways in which small players do come up. You're innovating, you're inventing, and this digital space is something that is so large, which is so huge, and everyone has a place to come in with an innovation. There are uncomfortable, questions that need to be debated. How to define a market? How to define dominance? And how does one look at the convergence not only between patents law and competition law, but between all the sections of the government? And uh, thank you for this patient hearing. Many of you might have heard me earlier, but it is definitely a very serious concern of mine because we have to create open markets. That doesn't mean to say there are no antitrust concerns. 
But those antitrust concerns are very difficult and they require investigation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rima, how are we doing on time? Okay, I think uh, we should uh, take a couple of questions at least from the floor. We've had uh, four interesting uh, uh, conversations here stretching across a wide terrain. And uh, I will take two minutes at the very end to summarize a few points that I've made. Uh, Pavan. acceleration of some of these innovations and, and, and deeper commercialization. What are some of your thoughts about what many of us around the room or places like ISB and others could do in terms of getting more commercialization activity happening? Yeah, it's a good question. First of all, uh, I will make a remark which might be provocative, but the hunger for innovation in the Indian large companies is very low. Absolutely no doubt about it. They are very happy growing as they are because of various institutions and structures of policies, and that's good for them. I mean, I don't grudge them. But their willingness to search and look for innovations from outside is limited. Having said that, it's very interesting that we receive more queries from international companies in the recent past than the national companies. And they want to learn more about what we do and how we do. Second thing, in the health sector, we have animal health, human health, plant health, all of, lot of leads. For example, there's a single plant extract which dissolves cataract in the eyes, so you don't need operation. The clinical trials are going on, Dabur has shown a lot of interest, so that might be one of the first drugs which might come to the market by a larger company because it has shown remarkable results. So there's a possibility that many of these Leads will generate a solution that might go to a large number of people. Our, we have plant varieties which have diffused to 100,000 acres, hectares in 7, 10, 12 states. We have an apple variety which has been diffused to 27 states and it grows in plain. In Rashpati Bhavan, apple is coming in this season. All right. Now, Harman Sharma, who has developed this or who has identified this plant mutant and then developed this variety, will change the way Apple will be seen in the future. And you will remember that man for having contributed to that concept that apples can be eaten in the plains, in Rajasthan for that matter. So there are some very transformative technologies coming out in agriculture, horticulture, health, other areas. Please understand that Ayurveda has only about 1,600 plants broadly. We have 43,000 species. There's a very vibrant knowledge system of this country over the years has experimented, evolved various solutions. So there's a huge market waiting to be tapped in herbals. 20 years ago, I did a small study on green consumerism, and I found that the scales were evenly uh, set at that time, and market could go probably the herbal way. Today, there is not a single toothpaste which you can find in the market which doesn't have a herbal content. How did this transformation come about in just 20 years? So there is a great trend that is visible in the marketplace. People want to go green, they want to buy herbal, they want to have vegetative colors instead of synthetic colors, whole range of things. And I find, I see that as an opportunity for what we do. So our time is almost there, it's going to come. And uh, we have agreement with CSIR, very, very privileged to have agreement with CSIR, with ICMR, and with ICR. So the best of the formal science institutions are helping us. Not one scientist, incidentally, charges us for their time. Not one scientist. They will take consumers in some cases, or some cases maybe a fellowship of their student, but scientists don't charge for their time to us. So this movement is growing through a great pro bono health. Not a single patent attorney charges for their time. So our 900 patents have been filed, 27 so in US, not a single patent attorney has charged his or her fees. Only mm -hmm. filing charges. So we get huge contribution. Honeybee Network gets huge contribution from society, including the formal sector, for the work that we're doing. So it is not work that only the one network or one institution or one group has done. So I see a lot of promise in the future. And I hope that the students of ISB will join hands with us and take these ideas forward. <coughs> we are very uh, positive about uh, finding partners who will take these innovations forward. 
but please don't restrict to only artifactual aspect of our innovation. The conceptual aspect, the heuristic aspect is even more powerful, which will trigger new ways of doing business in future. Thanks. Yes. Sorry. This is Sheetal from Ericsson, and I've got a couple of questions coming straight from my personal observation. Uh, first question is from Anil. Um, you showed us beautiful innovations, and I've myself been an ardent follower of NIF, and we see a lot of you know, innovations being listed there. Um, and this makes us feel proud as Indian, too. Um, but when you look at from a 30 feet thousand height, uh, generally any country that is ranked on an innovation potential, you see what is a patent footprint. And where you see a dichotomy, because if you look at the patent footprint, it's maybe 30s to 70, where it's only 30% which is domestic. In spite of so many innovations, you don't find it in the patent system yet. And one of the reasons is because patent system does not uh, accord protection to such frugal innovations. They are highly useful, but may not stand the test of innovative threshold. I just wanted to ask your view, views as to what is uh, making India shy to implement or, or even start discussion about utility model as a concept, which we have seen in other countries. We have 900 patents on our list, on our website listed, and our filing rate is very good actually. I mean, 900 patents in about last uh, eight years, most of them, not 18 years. Uh, and we have patent granted in US to our innovations. And we have fought against TKDL. And TKDL <laughs> opposed our application and we won. For typhoid lead in US, we got mm -hmm. a patent granted. Because uh, obviously the claims in TKDL did not stood, stand the ground. So I'm, I teach a course in IPR and we have developed the concept of technology commons, which means people to people copying is allowed and encouraged, but people to firm through licensing. Simple. <laughs> we have put the system on its head. We don't care what the system has been, has been evolved in the West. Our country needs this model. Because one farmer to another farmer, we don't want to come in the way. Please, any self-employed person can use that. But people to firm through licensing. So I agree that there is a need for a great deal of improvement, but I don't find it constraining us at all. The current patent system is not coming in our way at all. It takes a long time, that's a problem, but that is a problem for everybody, not just for us. It's for everybody. But if utility patent system came, that would be good because in any case, very few patents are maintained for its full life. The reason why I built the abundant database, abundant patent database is that large number of small producers cannot maintain a patent for 20 years because the cost keeps on increasing, you know. So therefore, in electronics, in any case, obsolescence factor is so high that having 20 year patent for an electronic uh, product is not warranted even in the mainstream for the companies. So there's a need to rethink the patent regime for various kinds. So utility patent will be useful not just for grassroots innovation, it will be useful for many incremental innovations that can perhaps, they don't need that much. So Australia developed an innovation patent system where they had maximum of eight claims, five, eight years, five claims, $250 fees, easy to grant. Switzerland has just a registration system. In Swiss national patent system, they don't examine. And the, argue, the, the history shows that let the market judge whether your patent claim is worthwhile or not. Why do we waste time? So Swiss national patent system is merely a registration system. It is not an examination system. But the record of Swiss patents, both the one which go through PCT route and the one which are national system, is reasonably good. People maintain self-discipline and don't file frivolous patents. So I think there is a case for what you're saying, but I, at least at this moment, we don't feel too uh, stifled because of the lack of utility patents. I mean, we are doing fine. I mean, patent office has been respecting our claims and we have standing prior art, uh, such as are very rigorously done in our system. So we don't face a problem. Okay, uh, my last question. Two questions and one is from Rishikesh. I mean, there is a lot of uh, data points that you showed about the, uh, you know, there is a lot of dependence on imports, whether you look at electronics, telecom, electricals, and therefore there is a huge cash output of, you know, 12 to 15 billion US dollars every year. And therefore, Government of India has been taking really great steps in stopping that, where we talk about import substitution. A lot of, you know, push mechanisms are being created, like, you know, increase in custom duty. But generally, as a citizen and as, as a curiosity from being a researcher as well, if you look at from the cost-based analysis for any importer, if the cost of import is much less as against the cost of local manufacturing, uh, what incentive do I have as a manufacturer to really think about locally manufacturing and stopping imports? 
So I, I think at least from my point of view, I would focus more on the startup ecosystem. And I think one important area we have totally neglected there is the public procurement and the yes. related dimensions of that. I know that opens up another area with relate, related to government purchase procedures and so on. But I think the best way of getting more Indian manufacture into things is by helping firms who don't have a track record. Typically in the government, if you look at most procurement the processes, they'll always have a pre-qualification clause, which just cuts out all new producers. I, I would say the best way of getting more manufacturers into the system is actually to start focusing on that so that people get established rather than, you know, playing too much in the tariff domain. Yes, sir. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Sumit and I'm a student of PGB Pro Blast 2019. Uh, so my uh, question is to Dr. Grish. Uh, now uh, we're talking about product innovation in a lot of senses. We're talking about, uh, you know, focusing on product innovation. But uh, one of the reasons which I could no. see from the presentation was that, you know, a lot of companies are, we're not able to take these products or innovations to the market because of lack of process innovations. And, uh, you know, uh, and one of these things come from uh, one of these concepts comes from you know Anil's presentation on the frugality of uh, of uh, the innovation because uh, you know it has to be sustainable and frugal for the manufacturer as well. So uh, do you think that one of the reasons that we are not filing enough patents or we don't have innovation uh, as compared to other countries is because the lack on focus uh, of See China uh, and India. In terms of now our filing is about eight thousand patents total in India. You to tell for me. Indian, See, especially this, into uh, the pharma space, I would say, China, because, uh, you know, a lot of these things are coming into because, you know, a lot of these new molecules are being, uh, you know, uh, patented and uh, as compared to, because earlier, in, in, when you talk about pharma space in India markets was that, you know, there were a lot of fo more focus about process innovation. Right now, it's more about product innovation, lack of, you know, process innovation and stuff. Yeah, for many, many years, the opportunity that came up was for process, but it was for for entities that were not IPR protected. See, we had this patent at 1970 or 72, which gave a lot of freedom for Indian companies to actually bypass the international patent regime. Now, by and large, it was good for India, for poor countries, but it was not necessarily received very well. So after the WTO, GATT, and the globalization came, all these things came under stress. Be that as it may, now that the Indian pharma industry grew up to be some of the best, you know, you know, a lot of money to invest, so a mindset change is slowly coming about, but the regulatory regime of taking new molecules, the risk involved, the whole philosophy of taking that kind of a big risk in Indian companies is somewhat, I would say, somewhat low. It requires a big boy's mindset also, not just big boy's arms. Yeah. You know, so I think, but it's coming about. Now, we, what is the role R&D people can make like us? We continue, we should continue to generate that early stage breakthroughs, which give us a whole pipeline of prospective new lead molecules. That is also has been a challenge. Why it has been a challenge? Not because of the intellectual weakness, but the focus of the intellects has been towards early stage discovery, knowledge, etc. That is changing, but a hand holding and a few good success stories. Success begets more success. Our success in biogenerics came after two or almost two decades of hard work, collaboration between industry and academia and R&D labs. That other phase is only beginning. Uh, a huge amount of money is required to take molecules forward, especially in the conventional pharma space, bio, bio products, new products, etc. But in traditional medicine-based products, you have two models. One, what Anil Gupta talked about. Here also, there is a great potential of national labs partnering with this ground, ground state innovation and doing the early stage. You know, actual pre-commercialization pre pre stage. That also, there's a lot of potential. You know, you need investment, but very, very well thought out investment. So we believe that the innovation funds, etc. Bayrak has been doing a good job for spin-offs. But if you take selected technology with promise, whether you take from the frugal space or you take from the national lab and say take it through a peer review, good process where industry also participates, 
and you take some of these things and start nurturing them so that the first product line starts coming out. This is very important. The pudding comes out. We have a recipe for a pudding and then you have a collection of uh, things on the, on the kitchen table, but where is the product coming out? So you, I think the products, for example, honeybee produces probably come up after a lot of incubation and hard work. Now if national labs and honeybee and this sort of thing comes over and say there is a commitment and the industry is, gets a ringside view of that, I think that would actually lead to a lot of things coming and grabbing their attention. The industry will want to invest where there is a risk minimization. Now if you talk to them with a patent, a credibility factor comes into it. It much rather take B-class technology from abroad for a say for an auto, but for pharma you need innovation and that innovation needs to be nurtured for at least five to seven years before you are pretty sure that the risk has substantively decreased. Who, will go, who is going to invest in that? There is a great opportunity for national labs. There is a great challenge for the regulatory system to fast track these, these, these things. But thinking is going on in that, I, I, would, I would say. So there is a, there is a silver streak there. Thanks. Uh, I'm afraid that we've run out of time now. So. No, we're already 15 minutes over. Uh, myself, S.C. Roy from National Law University, Patna. My question is to Dr. Gauri, Geeta Gauri. Man. Just uh, I heard the word that uh, IP are intellectual property rights, but uh, worldwide were intellectual protection rights. Mm -hmm. Is there any change or difference, as you were saying, saying that uh, yeah. uh, you know that uh, idea, trademark, and the trade secrets can be shared? So because of that, there is intellectual pro protection rights. Protection. So before becoming a property, should it be shared? As well as my uh, perception is that, that ideas are in public domain. Unless and until it is given uh, labor skill and judgment, it cannot have a property and can't have a rights. That intellectual uh, protection rights or intellectual property rights. So I want to learn and play the in National Law School, Dr. Professor Ayar. National Law School. International protection rights. I think for 70 years we had only protection rights. <laughs> International or domestic, that's all we had. You see, the basic point is that property rights. Patent rights is given to intellectual property when it gets commercialized. And that is a right that has a certain sanctity and should be, um, should be supported. Trade secrets or copyrights also have a certain sanctity that should be supported. Then there would be general secrets or general strategies between two firms. That also is a personal thing. Now, I don't know if I've understood it correctly. I think I'll ask the dean of ISB to answer it. <laughs> well, uh, I'm prepared to talk about it, but uh, you know we're already 20 minutes over time, and perhaps this should be a conversation uh, during the break, uh, during the lunch break. <coughs> also, this is a topic uh, which uh, we can debate till the cows come home, and uh, we've finished all the wine. And uh, so let me just take a couple of minutes to summarize. I'll, I'll make uh, only one. I mean, we, uh, each of the speakers did a wonderful job covering a wide terrain. Uh, and so I'll just take one or two points from each person. Uh, Rishi, uh, you know, you did a wonderful job uh, laying out the structure and the balance <coughs> that is needed uh, to bring in both, uh, you know, frugal and process innovations, you know, into the picture. And uh, you, you also pointed out uh, something which is very near and dear to me, and that's the value of human capital. And that's what we do at academic institutions. And perhaps as we look at the next stage and we look at the digital space and uh, you know, the, uh, the revolution that's going on in infotech, uh, you know, maybe the, the country stands a good chance, a decent chance, if we can get our act together collectively. And so I think, uh, you know, thanks for pointing that out. Um, uh, Girish, uh, I think your main theme really has been uh, this whole issue of taking um, ideas from the lab to proof of concepts to ultimately commercializing them and um, extracting value. And I think this is again where uh, 
organizations, uh, not, not only academic institutions, but the commercial organizations uh, need to get together. You talked about uh, the diabetic area, and this reminds me of uh, one of my good friends, Vinita Bali. She was a uh, chair for uh, Britannia. For Britannia. Britannia. And they had come up with a biscuit that was amenable for diabetics and NutriChoice. And they spent a lot of time designing something that tasted good and was also healthy. And that's a tough thing to do. But when they introduced it to the market, they failed. And the reason they failed is that uh, we, we Indians like to dip our biscuits in tea. And when they dipped that biscuit, it disintegrated and disappeared. <laughs> so they had to come back and reinvent the texture so that the biscuit, so what I'm saying is, you could have the idea, you could have the, sure. uh, the molecule, but you still have to make people eat the biscuit. And so we, we really need to look at, uh, at the commercialization, at the go-to market aspects. Uh, Anil, um, you know, fantastic job. And uh, I think you've inspired uh, many of us. And uh, this idea of G2G from grassroots to global is critical. Uh, previously, I used to think about, you know, maybe um, innovation for Indians by Indians. And then it became innovation for emerging markets by Indians. But you're raising the scale to going to innovations for the global market. I uh, just, uh, I was, uh, you know, had wonderful examples, and one of the examples you brought out was the infrared wind detector. I tell you, that particular invention can go global very, very quickly because there's so many needle phobic patients around the world. And uh, that idea can, in my opinion, be really quickly monetized if, if commercialized properly. But again, this speaks of, uh, you know, doing things together, and I really like the idea of, uh, moving from downloading to uploading ideas. And you brought that out in, in many, many circumstances. And perhaps collectively as a group, we can generate a, in a platform along that line. Uh, Gita, you've been a big advocate for balancing incentives and liabilities. And there's too much perhaps on the liability side. And uh, so out here there's a a lot of uh, work uh, that needs to be done. We need to encourage uh, you know, the, the property rights, uh, but uh, at the same time, we need to make uh, life a lot easier uh, you know, you know, for, the, for the industry. And the examples that you brought up, the automotive sector, you know, the, the, you know, for Google and so on, these are you know, multi-sided multi issues that uh, need a much richer understanding than following uh, instructions or following rules uh, that are perhaps uh, a bit old. So thanks for pointing that out, and it looks like you know, we have a work uh, cut out on, on that particular dimension. I know that, uh, Rima, you've been very anxious for us to yeah. move on to the next stage. So. Fantastic discussion, and would like to uh, show a token of appreciation for everyone. So we have small gifts that we would request our dean to hand over to all the panelists. And then, Anil, I'll request you to hand over our token of appreciation to our dean for doing such a fantastic job of summarizing and moderating the panel. So if you can hand that over. So I'll invite Pritika to please give the token of appreciation. Um. Dr. Girish Sahani. Can you also request a joint picture? Sure. Shri Anil Gupta. And Dr. Geeta Gauri. Request a group picture with all the panelists. Uh, 